Welcome to a new episode of System Update. I'm Glenn Greenwald. This edition is an in-depth exploration of the sham corrupt prosecution of former Obama defense official and former Trump National Security Advisor General Michael Flynn, a prosecution which the Department of Justice on May the 7th announced that it was asking a court to dismiss. There are multiple reasons why it is so critical to understand what actually happened in this case and what didn't happen in this case. To begin with, there are very melodramatic, even apocalyptic proclamations circulating in various media and political circles about the significance of the Justice Department's decision to drop the prosecution. These flamboyant warnings about the critical importance of the Flynn prosecution and the cataclysmic consequences of the Justice Department's decision to request its dismissal are particularly odd since General Flynn was accused of a single crime lying to the FBI, pled guilty to it, and then the prosecutor, Robert Mueller, and his prosecutorial team acknowledged that the crime was not particularly serious by recommending to the judge that General Flynn be sentenced to not a single day in prison citing both the cooperation he gave to the prosecution as well as the nature of the crime. So even the prosecutors in this case have said that the conviction that came from the plea bargain doesn't warrant a second in prison time, and yet we're hearing that the refusal to proceed with it is the end of American justice as we know it. Apparently, under this view, prior subversions of justice by the executive branch, such as the act that I regard as the single most corrupt attack on basic justice in the United States, which is the decision by President Bush 41 to pardon numerous of his closest aides implicated in crimes relating to the Iran-Contra scandal, including his defense secretary, Casper Weinberger, who had been charged with perjury. Crimes and trials that would have likely led to the investigation and probably the conviction of President Bush 41 himself. The claim is that all of that pales in comparison to the Justice Department's decision to drop the case against General Flynn. The same is true for President Clinton's pardon of the extremely wealthy and high Democratic donor Mark Rich or the Obama administration's decision to immunize the torturers of the CIA, who as part of the Bush administration tortured people around the world in order to enable President Obama's political agenda to be realized. All of this, we're being told, is essentially trivial in comparison to the decision by the Justice Department to drop the case against General Flynn. There's another reason it's so important to understand what happened in this case, which is that it sheds light on and directly relates to very widespread corruption on the part of the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, the DOJ, and other agencies within the U.S. security state during the 2016 election for overtly political ends. We already know of several extremely shocking revelations demonstrating abuse of power on the part of those agencies as part of the 2016 election. The Mueller investigation itself revealed that the two critical conspiracy theories that drove Russiagate for three years, number one, that Donald Trump and the Trump campaign conspired with the Kremlin to interfere in the 2016 election, and that number two, the Kremlin exerted all kinds of blackmail leverage over Donald Trump to effectively be able to rule the United States for the benefit of Moscow using not just compromising videotapes, but also financial leverage. We know that all of that turned out to be a myth, a conspiracy theory without basis. And we know that for all kinds of reasons, particularly the fact that the Mueller investigation after 18 months of highly aggressive, subpoena-driven probes into every component of those conspiracy theories ended without indicting even a single American, not one single American indicted for the crime of conspiring with Russia to interfere in the 2016 election. And the Mueller report didn't even hint at, let alone give credibility to, let alone prove that there was any leverage being exerted over Donald Trump or the Trump White House 
by the Kremlin when it comes to things like blackmail leverage or other financial leverage. So the collapse of those two core conspiracy theories by themselves ought to reveal that what happened in terms of this sweeping investigation during a presidential election under President Obama by the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, and other agencies within the security state is a much greater scandal than the supposed scandal of Russiagate and Trump-Russia collusion that commanded and claimed the attention of our political and media class for almost three years. But beyond that generalized corruption, there is very specific corruption that has already been demonstrated in terms of how the investigation into Russiagate has been conducted. Corruption, which notably and revealingly has received very little attention. Perhaps the most egregious of it concerns the spying that was done by the FBI, by the Justice Department, on U.S. citizen and former Trump advisor, Trump campaign advisor, Carter Page. It was revealed throughout 2017 and into 2018 that the FBI had obtained FISA warrants to spy on the communications of Carter Page. Spying on the email and telephone communications of a U.S. citizen is one of the most draconian acts that the FBI and the U.S. government can do, and yet they did it to Carter Page after, shortly after, he had served as an advisor to the Trump campaign, yet while the presidential campaign was still underway. And for two years, we heard Carter Page is clearly an agent of the Russian government. He was clearly a key cog in the conspiracy to conspire between Trump, the Trump campaign and Russia to interfere in the election. We heard it vehemently denied that the Steele dossier, the unproven, unvetted mountain of allegations, served as a basis for the FISA allegation. And yet, after a very comprehensive investigation by the Inspector General of the, Ju the Department of Justice in 2019, a comprehensive report was issued that concluded that not only was there no basis for believing that Carter Page was an agent of the Russian government, but the FBI lied to the FISA court in order to obtain the warrants to eavesdrop on him. An incredibly serious scandal for the FBI to spy on somebody who had been associated with a rival campaign during a presidential election when it turned out that not only was there no basis for doing so, but that they actually lied to the court in order to obtain those warrants. And it was the Mueller report itself that made clear that there was never any reason to believe, contrary to the definitive assertions of the media and political consensus that we heard for years, there was no reason to believe that Carter Page was ever an agent of the Russian government. The Mueller report itself concluded, quote, Carter Page worked for the Trump campaign from January 2016 to September 2016. He lived and worked in Russia. However, the investigation did not establish that Page coordinated with the Russian government in its efforts to interfere with the 2016 election. And to this very date, Carter Page has never been charged with any crimes relating to the investigation of Russiagate. He was never charged as being an agent of the Russian government. He was never charged with conspiring with Russia to interfere in the 2016 election. It turns out that he, whatever you think of him, was unjustly spied upon by his own government, by the United States government, as part of this Russiagate hysteria. There are other aspects of the Mueller investigation that also reveal serious corruption on the part not of the targets of the investigation, but the investigators itself. They used a highly shady long-term CIA operative named Stephen Halper, who is most famous or infamous for having acted as a spy for the Reagan campaign in 1980 by working within the Carter administration and passing classified foreign policy deliberations and decisions on the part of the Carter presidency to the Reagan campaign. It was widely believed that it was run through Reagan's vice presidential candidate, George Bush 41, who had previously been the director of the CIA and had all kinds of CIA contacts. But Halper was wildly discredited for his role in that spying campaign on the Carter presidency, and yet Halper pops up in the middle of the Russiagate investigation to serve as an informant on the part of the FBI, essentially a spy planted 
within the circle of Trump campaign officials to approach George Papadopoulos and to approach Carter Page and report back what he was hearing and finding to the FBI, exactly what has long been claimed that the FBI had essentially planted a spy, a former CIA operative with close ties to the Bushes within the Trump campaign during the course of the presidential election. But also, it was the same Stephen Halper that first tried to raise concerns that General Flynn had should have his patriotism and his loyalties held under suspicion because he claimed that General Flynn was speaking with and working with a Russian scholar, a woman named Svetlana Lakova, who was at Oxford. And he was concerned, Stephen Halper was, he said, that Svetlana Lakova was basically a honeypot, a sex pot designed to entrap General Flynn to turn into a spy. As it turns out, there's zero evidence that Svetlana Lakova was anything other than a scholar studying at Oxford. She's suing not only Helper, but also numerous media outlets that depicted her in these terms, essentially as being a prostitute, somebody exploiting sex in exchange for information on behalf of the Russian government. It was Helper who did that to Flynn. It was very similar to the way that the Justice Department, when they announced their indictment of the Russian citizen Maria Butina for having engaged in activism in the United States, which they claimed that was being done on the part of the right on behalf of the Russian government without disclosing that she was doing so. Not a serious crime. Washington is full of people acting on behalf of foreign governments who don't file their disclosure forms. But because she was Russian, it was made into a big deal. But the worst part was they used this same misogynistic stereotype about Russian women claiming that she too had traded sex for information. The media smeared her essentially also as a prostitute in headlines claiming she traded sex for information only for it to turn out that it was a complete fabrication on the part of the Justice Department, which ultimately admitted that it was false. So we see all kinds of actual corruption on the part of the investigators themselves and I think this corruption and how it functioned and the mentality that drove it is most illustrated by the sham corrupt prosecution of Michael Flynn, which has finally now come to an end, which makes it so urgent that people understand what actually happened here. There are other really important reasons why it's so critical to dive deeply into and understand fully what happened in the Flynn prosecution. Another reason is that there has been a spate of newly revealed evidence, critical and incriminating evidence over the last several weeks in the form of FBI notes concerning their attempt to ensnare Michael Flynn into criminality, House Intelligence Committee transcripts that were part of their investigation into Russiagate and the Mueller probe, as well as new documents that were part of various FISA processes that have shed all new light on the corruption that drove not just the Michael Flynn prosecution, but the broader corruption and the very similar corruption that drove the entire Russiagate conspiracy theory as well that makes it more vital than ever to understand exactly what happened here. And then the final reason that I think it's so imperative to spend the time to delve deeply into this question, this event, is that in order to justify and support the prosecution of Michael Flynn. And in order to depict the decision by the Justice Department to drop that prosecution, and in order to justify the broader Mueller probe and the prosecutions that it entailed, it has been necessary for Democrats, for liberals, and even for people on the left to renounce and jettison long-held, long-standing principles about the criminal justice system about the abuses of the Justice Department and the CIA and the NSA, about the way in which these powers of surveillance and prosecution often are abused for improper and for political ends. It is extraordinary to hear, for example, people in the Democratic Party or who associate as liberals or on the left saying things like, why, if Michael Flynn didn't do anything wrong, would he lie to the FBI? Or why, if Michael Flynn didn't commit a crime, would he have pled guilty when for decades it has been known that innocent people 
plead guilty all the time because the rules of the justice system are so rigged against them that they're incentivized to plead guilty even when they've done nothing wrong. There have been law review articles written and very celebrated newspaper journal essays by judges documenting the reasons why the criminal justice system and the way in which it's so tilted in favor of the prosecution and the Justice Department and the FBI makes it so that innocent people routinely and frequently plead guilty because of tactics that prosecutors can use. And suddenly that all of that is cast aside in order to defend the Michael Flynn prosecution and to insist that he belongs in prison in the broader probe of the Mueller investigation. So I think it's really worth digging in, not just to the factual events of the Flint prosecution, but also the principles underpinning it and the reasons why I and others believe that this prosecution has been a corrupt sham. Now, there's one point I think it is vital to make before delving into the facts about this entire discussion concerning the Michael Flynn prosecution, which is the following. There is nothing ideological about one's views regarding the justifiability of Michael Flynn's prosecution. Just like there has never been anything ideological about one's views of the propriety of the Mueller investigation or the conspiracy theories that gave rise to it. These are not ideological questions, they are evidentiary questions, which is a separation, a distinction that is crucial to understanding and talking about politics in a meaningful way, but that has been deliberately abolished. Ideological questions, whether you're on the left or the right, entail things like, what is your view of the proper American foreign policy? What is your view of the justifiability of particular wars or invasions or bombing campaigns? What is your view of the proper rate of corporate taxation or programs to eliminate income inequality or wealth inequality or to provide help and assistance and subsidies to the neediest people in society. All of those questions are ideological. They're about policy disputes and how you answer them determines whether you're on the left or the right. And conversely, whether you're on the left or right should determine how you answer those questions. That is not true for issues like whether you believe the Michael Flynn prosecution was justifiable. It is not true for whether or not you believe the conspiracy theories about Trump and Russia conspiring for the election or Trump being blackmailed by Vladimir Putin actually are supported by evidence that have nothing to do with ideology. There's nothing left-wing or right-wing about evaluating whether there's evidence to support those conspiracies. There's nothing left-wing or right-wing left -wing right about your views on whether or not the prosecution of Michael Flynn was justifiable or whether it was a corrupt abuse of power. They're not ideological. What they are, are tribal. And this is what I think is a critical point about our politics. Our politics in the United States have become stripped of politics, of ideology. They've, our politics have paradoxically become depoliticized. So that now, whether you're characterized as being on the left or the right or the center has almost nothing to do with your actual views on ideological and political questions, the ones I enumerated earlier. They have everything to do with your tribal loyalty, whether you're willing to say things, even if you don't believe them, to advance the cause of one side or the other. Whether the prosecution of Michael Flynn was justified has nothing to do with left-wing or right-wing ideology. It has everything to do with your tribal loyalty. It's now expected that if you're going to be on the left or a liberal or a Democrat, you have to cheer for the prosecution of Michael Flynn because he's on the other side. Just like if you're going to be on the right, you have to view the prosecution of Michael Flynn as having been unjustified. This is a, a terrible and a distorting and a deceitful and a warping and obfuscating way to think about politics. We need to get back to understanding the difference between ideological questions what are your views on policy issues versus evidentiary issues? Whether you think a claim is supported by the evidence that ought to have nothing to do with your ideological perspective, in fact, has nothing to do with your ideology. So in talking about whether the prosecution of Michael Flynn was supported by evidence, whether in talking about whether the prosecution of Michael Flynn was legally justified, there's nothing remotely left-wing or right-wing about that, except to the extent that, as I mentioned earlier, left-wing views of criminal justice and the criminal law ought to lead one to find the prosecution very troublesome. 
But beyond that, we ought to be able to engage in evidentiary questions, including things like, do we believe Christine Blasey Ford? Do we believe Tara Reid's allegations against Joe Biden that are also stripped free of ideology and discuss them only as rational beings analyzing evidence independent of ideology. Whether you're on the left or the right should be left to ideological questions. What are your views on foreign and domestic policy? Evidentiary questions, one should be free to discuss those without the stigma or punishment of being accused of having a certain ideology because one is siding with one side's interests or the other. It doesn't make you on the left to cheer Michael Flynn's prosecution, even though Michael Flynn is a right-wing general, just like it doesn't make you on the right to question that prosecution or believe that it was unjustifiable. It is vital that we get back to this distinction in politics to be able to have meaningful, rational discourse with one another about evidentiary questions that shouldn't be determined by how one wants to be perceived ideologically. To really understand the Flynn prosecution, we need to first understand who Michael Flynn is. Michael Flynn is a lifelong Army intelligence officer who, during the War on Terror from 2002 until 2012, became renowned in military circles for his innovative use of intelligence, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, and really built a reputation as a modern, innovative, smart intelligence officer through those activities. And that led in 2012 to President Obama appointing him to one of the most important positions in all of the intelligence community, which is the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which oversees all military intelligence for the Pentagon and closely works with the CIA and the other prongs of the intelligence community. It's an incredibly sensitive and an incredibly influential position. General Flynn held that position for roughly two years because almost from the beginning, he and President Obama and President Obama's national security team clashed continuously. It's really not an overstatement to say that President Obama, after a very short period of time, couldn't stand Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn is exactly the kind of general and exactly the kind of official that President Obama strongly dislikes, and the feeling was very mutual. General Flynn became a very blunt and explicit critic of many of Obama's core counterterrorism programs, insisting, for example, that President Obama's reliance on drone strikes, which was a centerpiece of the Obama counterterrorism program, was wildly insufficient and, in fact, was counterproductive. He was also very aggressively critical of President Obama's policy in Syria, particularly allowing the CIA to train Syrian rebels, telling Obama over and over that those Syrian rebels were overwhelmingly Islamic extremists who belonged to al-Qaeda and other radical groups, and that the U.S. was therefore arming and training and empowering the very groups the war on terror was supposed to be dedicated toward fighting. There were personality conflicts because General Flynn tends to be very assertive and very messy, whereas President Obama likes cerebral and organized kinds of managers. But there were also definitely hardcore ideological and policy distinctions that ultimately culminated in, in General Flynn being forced out of his position in 2014, a relatively short period of time for someone to stay in that position. And by the time they left, there was a great deal of acrimony between President Obama and his White House on the one hand and General Flynn on the other, which really matters for the events a year or two later regarding General Flynn's first, the investigation of him, and then ultimately his prosecution. Just to give you a sense of what an outspoken critic General Flynn became, especially once he was fired slash resigned from, retired from that position with President Obama's administration. In 2015, my colleague Jeremy Scahill, working with other reporters at The Intercept, published a groundbreaking expose called The Drone Papers, which published large amounts of previously secret and classified information revealing the truth about President Obama's drone program, including the most incriminating fact that nine out of 10 people that are killed by President Obama's drone program were people whose identity was unknown to the US government, people they were not at all trying to kill. There were huge numbers of 
uh, the killings of innocent people far beyond what had previously been known. And as part of that story, Jeremy interviewed General Flynn, and he was very explicit and unfettered in his harsh critiques of President Obama's counterterrorism strategy and his reliance on drones. This is what he told Jeremy, quote, the drone campaign right now really is only about killing. When you hear the phrase, quote, capture, kill, capture is actually a misnomer. In the drone strategy that we have, capture is lowercase c. We don't capture people anymore. Our entire Middle East policy seems to be based on firing drones. That's what this administration decided to do in its counterterrorism campaign. They're enamored of the ability of special operations and the CIA to find a guy in the middle of the desert in some shitty little village and drop a bomb on his head and kill him. He continued in that same vein, charging that the White House relies heavily on drone strikes for reasons of expediency rather than effectiveness. He said, quote, we've tended to say, drop another bomb via drone and put out a headline that, quote, we killed Abu Bag of Donuts, and it makes us feel good for 24 hours. And you know what? It doesn't matter. It just made them a martyr. It just created a new reason to fight us even harder. Now, it's important to point out here that General Flynn was not a critic of Obama's drone program for the same reasons that many people on the left were. Quite the contrary. He disliked President Obama's reliance on drones because he wanted other kinds of more aggressive counterterrorism programs, including capturing people, detaining them in Guantanamo, rendering them to foreign countries, and harshly interrogating them because he thought the drones precluded the ability to interrogate them the more valuable way of dealing with terrorists to gain information because it was a simply an easy way to just kill them without expending any resources. So he was oftentimes critical of Obama from the right. And I want to make clear that in a lot of the differences, many, probably most of the differences on ideology and policy between General Flynn on the one hand and President Obama on the other, I side with President Obama. I have very little ideological compatibility with General Flynn when it comes to things like the war on terror. The important point here is that despite the fact that he is most definitely a right-wing general and was criticizing President Obama from the right, he wanted a more hawkish and more aggressive war on terror program. That was why he disliked drones, because he thought it was just a symbolic and cheap way of dealing with terrorism. What was important and what is important for the subsequent events is the fact that President Obama seethed, what seethed was contempt for General Flynn, and the feeling was very mutual. After General Flynn left the administration, he started a consulting firm along with his son, whose name is also Michael Flynn, and they represented numerous clients as people who leave the military and intelligence world often do, including foreign governments, including interest connected to the Turkish government. And that consulting work that General Flynn did at times was not properly disclosed, as is very common for consultants not to disclose their work. But that was the work that he was doing between 2014 when he left the Obama administration and 2016, in the middle of 2016, when he became an important surrogate for the Trump presidential campaign. In fact, Donald Trump was so comfortable working with Michael Flynn that he began seriously considering him to be his vice president. And Michael Flynn played an increasingly important role as the presidential campaign progressed in being a national security surrogate for Donald Trump. And his consulting work, including ones connected with foreign governments, continued even as he was an important campaign surrogate and an important campaign official for the Trump campaign. What we now know, because of an inspector general's report in 2019 issued through the Justice Department, is that in the middle of 2016, when the FBI and the Department of Justice and other agencies first began investigating ties between the Trump campaign on the one hand and the Russian government on the other, a camp an investigation that we now know was launched in the middle of the presidential campaign overseen by James Clapper and by Jim Comey, one of the targets of that investigation was General Flynn, despite the fact that he was a lifelong army intelligence official in very sensitive positions. The FBI was actually investigating whether he had corrupt or improper or even treasonous ties to the Russian government. But as it turns out, the FBI found nothing to support those suspicions. And in early January of 2019, obviously once Donald Trump was elected and then chose Michael Flynn to be his national security advisor, the FBI decided that it would close its investigation 
of General Flynn with regard to whether he was engaged in any improper dealings with the Russians. That was the criminal probe the FBI launched against Flynn in 2016 that ended in early January because no evidence was found to support the suspicions that fueled it in the first place. Shortly after President Trump's 2016 election victory in early November, it became circulated because the Trump campaign circulated it that the now president-elect Donald Trump was strongly considering choosing Michael Flynn to be his national security advisor or to serve in some other high-level position on his national security team. And President Obama met with Donald Trump after Trump's victory. And one of the things he told Trump, he urged him not to hire Michael Flynn, insisting that he was unreliable, that he was unstable, that he was an ideologue who couldn't be trusted, indicating, demonstrating that this acrimony that Obama Obama harbored for Flynn continued for at least two years after General Flynn left his administration. But Donald Trump, being Donald Trump, disregarded President Obama's advice and announced on November 17th that Michael Flynn would become his national security advisor. The following month in December, as the Trump transition team was preparing to take over as of the January 20th inauguration, General Flynn was obviously an important part of that transition team, being that he was going to be the national security advisor. And on December 29th, President Obama, the Obama administration, announced a new series of sanctions, as well as the expulsion of various diplomats aimed at Russia in order to punish Russia for what the Obama administration said was Russia's interference in the 2016 election. It was Obama's last, one of his last acts on the way out the door was to give Democrats what they wanted by sanctioning Russia, imposing, imposing new sanctions on Russia, and expelling Russian diplomats as retaliation or punishment for what they claim was Russian interference in the 2016 election. One of Donald Trump's core foreign policy planks when he was running for office was improved relations with Russia. His argument was, we don't need to be at odds with Russia in Syria because we need, we, neither of us have an interest in toppling Bashar al-Assad. We all have an interest jointly, Russia, Syria, and the United States, in working to defeat al-Qaeda and ISIS. In Syria, he wanted to work with Russia and other parts of the world geostrategically and said that the confrontation between the United States and Russia was not in Americans' interest, and therefore he wanted positive relations with Russia. For that reason, once the Obama administration announced the sanctions and the expulsion of diplomats, General Flynn, ready to take office as national security advisor, called the Russian ambassador to the United States, Sergei Kislyak, on two separate occasions on that day, December 29th, when these new reprisals were announced, essentially to tell him, look, there's no reason for you to overreact. There's no reason for you to retaliate. We're about to take office in three weeks. We're going to improve relations with you. We're going to have a whole new relationship. So there's no reason for you to do anything now that will force us in turn to retaliate. He was essentially trying to tamp down tensions, to lay the groundwork for one of President Trump's, President-elect Trump's, campaign promises and foreign policy objectives, which was to improve relations with Russia. It is extremely common for transition teams and for national security officials who are incoming in an administration to reach out to their counterparts to try and create a new positive relationship. And that's what General Flynn did by twice calling Ambassador Kislyak, whom he had known from his experience working as director of the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, on December 29th. Now, those two conversations that General Flynn had with Ambassador Kislyak were being monitored and recorded by the National Security Agency, something that is extremely common, is standard practice, as General Flynn knows and knew, because the NSA monitors and records the calls of as many officials as they possibly can, particularly in governments they consider to be adversarial, such as Russia. That was part of what we did with the Snowden reporting, which showed how many officials from foreign governments, even allied ones, like the German Chancellor Angela Merkel or the Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff and so many others, the NSA was spying on. So General Flynn obviously knew and later told the FBI that he knew that those conversations were being monitored and recorded, but they were being monitored and recorded because the NSA had successfully obtained access to Ambassador Kislyak's 
communications. Knowledge of those two telephone calls that Michael Flynn had with Ambassador Kislyak made its way to two particular officials with the FBI, Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, who became very controversial later on, both because they were having an affair with one another, an extramarital affair, but more importantly, because there were all kinds of email exchanges between the two throughout the 2016 presidential election as they were participating in the investigation of the Trump campaign, where they were explicitly talking about the need to make certain that Donald Trump lost, and then the need once he won to impede him, to damage him, and to try and undermine him any way that they can. So it was these two FBI officials who discovered these conversations that General Flynn had with Ambassador Kislyak. As I indicated earlier, James Comey and the leadership of the FBI had decided to close the only pending investigation that the FBI had into General Flynn, which was part of the Operation Hurricane investigation, the investigation about improper ties between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. James Comey and the FBI leadership had concluded there was no evidence to believe that General Flynn had any improper contacts or connections with, let alone had conspired with the Russian government during the election, and thus ordered that investigation closed and filed the paperwork in early January. But when Peter Strzok and Lisa Page got hold of these conversations that Ambassador Kislyak had had with General Flynn and decided they wanted to investigate him for it and use it against him, they discovered in early January that the order that James Comey and FBI leadership had given to close the investigation against Michael Flynn never was finalized because of a bureaucratic snafu. That investigation, contrary to the decision of the FBI, had remained open. And what the newly discovered documents reveal, among other things, is that Peter Strzok and Lisa Page celebrated the bureaucratic snafu as good luck because it meant that there was now a still a pending investigation that was supposed to have been closed into General Flynn that they could latch onto and hook onto in order to try and investigate him now because of these new conversations that he had with Ambassador Kislyak. Once these conversations were discovered, between Flynn and Kislyak, the FBI and the DOJ had what you could call an internecine war about how they should be handled. James Comey wanted to investigate General Flynn. He wanted to do what he could to use these newly discovered calls against General Flynn. But the Justice Department, then led by acting director, acting attorney general Sally Yates, believed that it was improper to investigate what was about to be a high-level White House official without notifying the Trump transition team and then the Trump White House that the FBI was investigating what was soon to become a very high-level official. And they fought about it, and they fought about it until James Comey, without notifying the attorney general or the Justice Department officials who were opposed to it, sent FBI agents to General Flynn's office with the intention of questioning him about the telephone calls that he had with the Russian ambassador. One of the most significant new documents revealed just within the last couple of weeks that has notably received very little attention in precisely those media outlets that most vociferously pushed maximalist Russiagate conspiracy theories for three years and that have been most vehement about denouncing the DOJ's attempt to dismiss the prosecution against General Flynn are handwritten notes by the FBI counterintelligence chief, Bill Priestap, on January 24th, the day that FBI agents, including Peter Strzok, were sent to General Flynn to interrogate him about the calls that he had with General Kis uh, with Ambassador Kislyak. And those handwritten notes made clear that the FBI was overtly flirting with and entertaining, if not outright executing, an interrogation with corrupt and improper motives, specifically to purposely induce General Flynn to lie to them so that they could use those lies to then punish him or turn him into a criminal. The handwritten notes from the FBI official, Bill Priestep, specifically, explicitly state, quote, what's our goal? Truth slash admission or to get him to lie so we can prosecute him or get him fired? This is revealing that the FBI had no real interest in interviewing General Flynn about what he said to Ambassador Kislyak because they already knew what he said since they had the transcripts of those conversations as a result of the surveillance that was done on those calls. The only conceivable objective to go and interview him was to purposely induce him to lie, not show him those transcripts, ask him what he talked about in that conversation that he had almost a month 
earlier in the hope of getting him to lie so that they could get him fired, not exactly a legitimate FBI objective, or turn him into a criminal, create a new crime by using their power of interrogation to induce him to lie and then charge him with lying to the FBI. Whatever the ultimate motive was, these notes are highly incriminating about what the FBI's real intentions were when they went to go and question him about those calls. Now, it took place in the interim between those two episodes, between the discovery by the FBI, Lisa Page and Peter Strzok in early January of the two conversations between Flynn and Kislyak, and January 24th when the FBI, over the objections of the Justice Department, without even the knowledge of the Justice Department, sent agents to interview General Flynn about those conversations. The events in the interim are critical to understanding just how severe is the abuse of power on the part of the security state agencies. Those events are critical. To begin with, it was in that first week of January when FBI Director James Comey went to New York to brief then-President-elect Donald Trump in the Trump Tower on what we now know is the Steele dossier to claim that there was a dossier compiled claiming that President Putin of Russia and the Kremlin had in its possession highly compromising information about President Trump of both the financial and sexual nature that would enable the Kremlin to blackmail the new U.S. president. And that briefing and that dossier was leaked by someone obviously wanting the public to then know about it to CNN. And CNN on January 10th reported that the Director of the FBI had gone and briefed President-elect Trump to inform him of highly compromising information in the hands of the Kremlin, but, this, but CNN said that they weren't going to describe the nature of that compromising information because they hadn't been able to vet it or determine whether or not it was really true, but that was a limitation that BuzzFeed quickly decided that they were not going to be constrained by, and so very predictably, and almost certainly intentionally from the perspective of whoever leaked this briefing, BuzzFeed then published what is now called the Steele dossier and that forever altered the course of Russiagate. Those allegations, those scurrilous and ultimately unproven allegations in the Steele dossier about the Kremlin holding blackmail information over Trump of both the sexual and the financial nature and all of the other highly inflammatory material ended up shaping what became Russiagate and at least the first two to three years of the Trump presidency leaked by the very same people who were in the process of now exploiting the failure to close the Flynn investigation to also investigate uh, General Flynn. Morning, President-elect Trump is responding more firmly this morning to claims that Russia has compromising personal and financial information about him. CBS News has confirmed FBI Director James Comey personally briefed the president-elect last week about the claims. Sources say Comey did not mention all the salacious details from a 35-page report. The dossier was produced by former British intelligence officer Christopher Steele. He worked for an investigative firm in London called Orbis Business Intelligence. Steele's investigation was commissioned by Fusion GPS, a Washington research company. An unidentified client requested the information. After the leaking of the SEAL dossier, first to CNN and then the publication of it by BuzzFeed, and during the interim when the FBI was planning to go and interrogate General Flynn about his two innocuous conversations with the Russian ambassador, other leaks began being deployed in order to subvert and undermine what had been the Trump administration before it even became the Trump administration before President Trump's inauguration. On January 12th of 2017, the Washington Post David Ignatius, who has built a career receiving leaks from the CIA and publishing what the CIA wants him to publish, published a column in which he revealed for the first time that the NSA had monitored the conversations between General Flynn on the one hand and Ambassador Kislyak on the other. And after that, the contents of the communications between General Flynn and Ambassador Kislyak were leaked to both the Washington Post and the New York Times, which published in detail what those communications were. Now, the reason that's so striking is because under the law, it is a crime, obviously, to leak classified information of any kind. Any information that's classified, if somebody inside the government leaks it to a journalist, that's a crime. 
But there's only a narrow number of types of information that can become a crime for the journalist to actually publish it. The most serious kind of information is not only a crime for that leaker to leak to the journalist, but for the journalist to publish it. And one of those types of information is exactly the type that people inside the intelligence community leaked in order to destroy the reputation of General Flynn, namely intercepts by the NSA of the communications of foreign officials. And the reason that the intelligence community and the law regards leaks of that type so grave as such a grave offense is obvious because it has the potential to ruin the ability of the NSA to continue to monitor that information by alerting the adversary that they have access to that communication. If you look at the relevant law, which is Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Section 798, that specifies when it's a crime, not just to leak classified information, but for a journalist to publish it, it specifies exactly the kind of information that people inside the government were leaking against General Flynn. That's how far they were willing to go. That law reads, quote, whoever knowingly and willfully communicates or otherwise makes available to an unauthorized person or publishes any class of government shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. Now, you can see it explicitly provides that the crime is not just leaking, but publishing. It's one of the few types of leaks where you can actually criminalize the journalist. Now, I'm against this law. I don't think that leakers or journalists should ever be prosecuted. But under the law, most leaks do not are not criminalized when they're, when they're published by the journalist, but this type of leak is so sensitive, leaking the private communications of a foreign government official and somebody else that the NSA monitors, that it's even a crime under the US code for a newspaper like the Washington Post, the New York Times, even to publish it. But they did publish it because it was leaked to them, which shows how far the intelligence community was willing to go. Now look at what was being done. Just look at what was being done inside the U.S. security state, the intelligence community and the Justice Department and Homeland Security and the CIA and the NSA, they initiated an investigation of the Trump campaign in the middle of the 2016 presidential campaign. They targeted a U.S. citizen who had been affiliated with that campaign with FISA warrants that were filled with and based on lies and based on an unvetted dossier provided to them that was the Steele dossier. They used informants, an informant who had a notorious record of having spied on the U.S. government to benefit the Reagan administration in order to act as informants against officials of the Trump campaign. They targeted General Flynn with claims that he was maintaining a sexual relationship with a Russian scholar at Oxford to call into question his patriotism. They were leaking highly scurrilous information that was unvetted and unproven to try and make Americans have a vision of the president-elect as somebody who had been in the Moscow Ritz-Carlton having prostitutes urinate on him to the point where he was a blackmail victim of a foreign power. And they were launching an investigation against the general for innocuous calls by exploiting a bureaucratic failure to close the investigation that had been opened against him because there were no there was no evidence to support the legitimacy of that investigation. Look at how concerted was the effort to target these members of the Trump campaign and then the Trump transition team to subvert the incoming president, to create crimes where none had exist, to leak in a way that was criminal in order to dirty their reputation. The key context for all of this is not just the abuse of power, the FISA process leaking, the ability to open investigations against people in the middle of a presidential campaign. The key context is what Chuck Schumer told Rachel Maddow after Donald Trump had criticized the CIA for having gotten WMD so wrong as part of the Iraq war. He warned President Trump on Rachel Maddow's show that if he stood opposed to the intelligence community, if he tried to thwart their policy interest or criticize them in any way, they had multiple weapons that they could use and would use to destroy him. Listen to Chuck Schumer himself explain how he views the intelligence community willingness, willingness to abuse their own power. The latest 
statement, latest tweet, as you were just saying, the president-elect's latest, latest yeah. unsolicited pronouncement on the intelligence community. This was his tweet just a little while ago tonight. You see the scare quotes there. The yeah. intelligence briefing yeah. on so-called Russian hacking was delayed until Friday. Perhaps more time needed to build a case. Very strange. We're actually told, intelligence sources tell NBC News since this tweet has been posted, that actually this intelligence briefing for the president-elect was always planned for Friday. It hasn't been delayed. Look. But he's, he's taking these shot this antagonism yep. is taunting to the intelligence community you, you take on the intelligence community they have six ways from sunday at getting back at you so even for a practical supposedly hard-nosed businessman he's being really dumb to do this what do you think the intelligence community would do if they were i don't know to? but i from what i told they are very upset with how he has treated them and talked now on january 24th that was when the fbi went and interviewed general flynn they had previously leaked to the Washington Post that he was not a target of any pending investigation to put him at ease about his conversation with the FBI. He agreed to speak with the FBI without a lawyer present because they made it made him believe that he was not being investigated. And as part of those conversations, the FBI asked him whether he had discussed with Ambassador Kislyak the question of sanctions, the sanctions imposed by President Obama in retaliation for the 2016 election interference, as well as the, the intention of the Trump administration to relax those sanctions, to, 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 to lift them as a way of encouraging Russia not to overreact. And apparently General Flynn either couldn't remember those conversations and told the FBI he couldn't remember what specifically he discussed in them, or he denied having discussed sanctions, even though he in fact had. And after General Flynn told the FBI either that he couldn't remember talking about sanctions or denying that he had a conversation about those sanctions with Ambassador Kislyak, the FBI began leaking again to the New York Times and the FBI the specific contents of the conversation to prove that General Flynn had lied to the FBI, as well as to Vice President Pence, who said publicly that General Flynn had not discussed sanctions in those calls with Ambassador Kislyak, and that led to General Flynn's firing in the second week of February because Donald Trump said his lies to Vice President Pence made him no longer suitable to hold that office. Now, what's really fascinating is that at the time we knew, because CNN reported, that even the FBI agents who spoke with General Flynn did not believe that he was being deliberately misleading, that he was intentionally lying to the FBI. Even CNN reported on February 17th, quote, the FBI interviewers believed Flynn was cooperative and provided truthful answers. Although Flynn didn't remember all of what he talked about, they don't believe he was intentionally misleading them, the official say. Newly discovered documents from the FBI files confirm what CNN reported all the way back then and what Flynn has maintained all along, which is the FBI officials who spoke to Flynn did not believe he was lying. And even FBI Director Jim Comey, a devoted enemy of Michael Flynn and the Trump administration by this point, obviously doing a lot to subvert and undermine them, said it was unclear whether Flynn had actually deliberately lied to the FBI. So it was reported that there'd be almost certainly no charges. He had lost his job, and people assumed that would be the end of that. In the interim, the Mueller investigation began. Jeff Sessions was forced to recuse himself from that investigation because the media discovered two communications that he had with Russian officials that he didn't remember having because they were very cursory and very informal and very ordinary, but they made it seem like that was sinister and meant that he might be in on the plot, which means he couldn't investigate or be a part of the investigation, analyzing whether the Trump campaign conspired with Russia, because maybe Jeff Sessions was part of the conspiracy as well. So he recused himself under pressure and appointed Robert Mueller as the special investigator, who then proceeded to investigate ties between the Trump campaign and Russia. And in December of 2017, it was announced that General Flynn was pleading guilty to one count of lying to the FBI, but Robert Mueller and his investigative team was recommending that there be no jail time, not a single day of jail time imposed for what General Flynn had pled guilty to because of the nature of the crime being not particularly serious and because General Flynn had been cooperative in answering all the questions that the Mueller team had for him.
Flynn's guilty plea has been pending for the last two years, the last two and a half years. There was speculation that President Trump might pardon him, although he never did. And then on May 7th, the Justice Department filed a motion with the criminal court overseeing the prosecution, requesting that the court dismiss the prosecution. And to do so, it cited the newly discovered evidence from the FBI that seemed to suggest that the FBI didn't believe that he was lying at the time and that the FBI was deliberately trying to entrap him because the FBI already knew what he had said to Ambassador Kislyak since it had the transcripts of the call and purposely didn't show it to him, trying to get him to lie to them so that they could turn him into a criminal. And most importantly of all, said the Justice Department, even if he had lied to the FBI about discussing sanctions with Ambassador Kislyak, that is a perfectly appropriate thing for an incoming national security agent uh, advisor to do in order to create good relations with a foreign country, something that uh, transition teams do all the time, and that there was no justification for having been investigating General Flynn during that interview because James Comey had already ordered the investigation against him closed for lack of evidence. So even if he lied to the FBI, it wasn't material to any pending legitimate investigation, which is an element of the crime. So the Justice Department requested for all of those reasons that the case against General Flynn be dismissed. And that has then what led to a week, a tidal wave of histrionic commentary that the Justice Department's decision is the end of the rule of law and American justice as we know it. Now, one last point about the factual events that define the Flynn prosecution. It's often brought up by people who want to justify the prosecution of Michael Flynn, that he did work that seems to have been on behalf of the Turkish government while he was an official with the Trump campaign and failed to disclose it. There's a lot of debate about whether that, in fact, happened and whether, if it had happened, it would be illegal. But what really matters for purposes of this discussion is that that claim that aspect of the case against Flynn regarding his work for the Turkish government was not a part of what he pled guilty to or what he was charged with. The New York Times, when announcing the Justice Department's motion to dismiss the case, made this manifestly clear when it stated, quote, prosecutors did not charge Mr. Flynn with crimes related to his work with the Turkish government. Now, it's certainly reasonable to believe that Michael Flynn engaged in sketchy behavior or even unethical or borderline criminal behavior, or even if you want criminal behavior by acting on behalf of the Turkish government and receiving money for it without disclosing it. That's a very common practice. On K Street, the law says that if you're acting as an agent of a foreign power, you need to file a disclosure form called FARA. It's common that people don't do it. They're almost never prosecuted. But whatever your view of that question is, that is not part of the prosecution we're discussing because there was no charges brought against General Flynn in connection with any work that he did in relationship to the Turkish government. Now, let's discuss the reasons why this prosecution is such a sham, why it's such an ex expression of the way in which these agencies routinely abuse their power throughout the latter part of 2016 and then into 2017 against officials with the Trump campaign, the Trump transition team, and then the Trump administration that they clearly did not like. The first point, what is it that General Flynn did that merited an investigation in the first place. Why was he being investigated at all by the FBI? The investigation that was open in mid-2016, seemingly without much of an impetus, without much of a justification, namely the investigation, the broad investigation into the question of whether Trump officials criminally conspired with the Russian government, a conspiracy theory for which the Mueller investigation, in their own words, found no evidence to establish took place. That investigation originally targeted General Flynn in mid-2016. Why? Why would the FBI target General Flynn to determine whether he was conspiring with the Russian government or acting on its behalf to interfere in the election. There was no basis, no foundation for them to have done so. The only evidence that one could cite, aside from his presence at an RT dinner where numerous other diplomats and ex-officials of governments and journalists and activists were present, attending an RT dinner is not a crime or ind indicative of you're acting on behalf of a foreign power at all. 
Aside from that, the only claim was that he had gotten too close to a woman of Russian descent who was a scholar at Oxford, as reported by Stephen Halper, the former CIA operative who spied on the Carter presidency to benefit the Reagan campaign seemingly at the behest of the Bush family. How is that even remotely justification for the U.S. government to investigate somebody for having misplaced loyalties or having conspired criminally with a foreign government? But whatever you believe about the initial justification for targeting General Flynn with an FBI investigation concerning his ties to the Russian government, even Jim Comey, even the FBI leadership, decided to close that investigation in early January of 2017 because they had found no evidence of wrongdoing that would have warranted ongoing investigations, let alone indictments and charges being brought against General Flynn for improper relations with the Russian government. So the FBI itself had concluded that there was no more reason to investigate him. So that was when the FBI agents within it, like Lisa, well, but Peter Strzok and, and, and the lawyer Lisa Page, who have demonstrated bias against the Trump campaign and the Trump administration, decided to exploit the bureaucratic failure to close that investigation to now target him for the calls that he had made with Ambassador Kislyak. Now, let's assume the worst part about that call, which is we haven't seen the transcripts yet, so nobody actually knows what was said, but let's assume the worst thing about that call, which is that General Flynn, before he was National Security Advisor, but already indicated to be that incoming by President-elect Trump, picked up the phone and called Ambassador Kislyak to discuss with him the sanctions that had just been imposed on Russia by the Obama administration in order to assure the Russians that the Trump administration did not intend to be confrontational or antagonistic toward, toward Moscow, and that there was therefore no reason for the Russians to engage in reprisals, which would in turn force the Trump administration to then engage in reprisals, which could spiral quickly out of control. He was trying to tamp down the tensions that have been created by those expulsions and by those sanctions in order to say, we're going to be in power in about three weeks, and we can work on it then. There's no reason for you to overreact. And in fact, that call succeeded. The Russians decided and announced that they weren't going to engage in retaliation. What is wrong with that? What is ethically or morally wrong with that? And more importantly, what is even conceivably criminal about the incoming national security advisor reaching out to a counterpart in a foreign government three weeks out of taking power in order to try and smooth over tensions and conflict and lay the foundation for better relationships. The only conceivable law, the only conceivable law that could be cited to claim that General Flynn did anything remotely illegal when having conversations as the incoming national security advisor with an official of the Russian government about those sanctions is a law called the Logan Act, which technically criminalizes any attempt by an ordinary citizen to conduct his or her own foreign policy in conflict with the official foreign policy of the United States. Now, this is a law that in 150 years, nobody has ever been charged with. It has never been used in the last 150 years at all by the Justice Department, and no one has ever been charged with the Logan Act, in part because it's almost assuredly unconstitutional. You can't prohibit a citizen of the United States from Act, engaging in activism or speaking to foreign governments to agitate for a different foreign policy. But it's especially, obviously, manifestly inapplicable to someone like General Flynn, who's not just an ordinary citizen, he's the incoming national security advisor three weeks away from taking over, from being in charge of U.S. foreign policy. The idea that you would apply the Logan Act to a key member of the national security transition team for reaching out to a foreign government and telling them, oh, don't worry, we're gonna change foreign policy in order to tamp down tensions and rising conflict is ludicrous. It's indescribably preposterous that you could possibly prosecute just, uh, General Flynn for having made those calls under an obviously unconstitutional and archaic law like the Logan Act. The Logan Act is often the last desperate pitch of partisan fanatics when they want to punish someone from the other party. For example, in 2007, at a time when the Bush administration was trying to isolate Syria and Bashar al-Assad because of claims that the Syrian government was helping Iraqi rebels and arming them and helping them to kill U.S. troops, Nancy Pelosi, as the ranking Democrat in the House, went and visited 
uh, President uh, uh, Assad in Damascus, and there was some kind of movement on the far right to say that she should be prosecuted for violating the Logan Act. Of course, it never went anywhere. Of course, the uh, minority leader of the House is permitted to go and visit a foreign leader, even if the U.S. government doesn't want her to. That's why this law and, and the theories to that have been promulgated to justify investigating General Flynn for these calls are so ludicrous. And what makes it even more important and what makes it even more absurd is that it is very common for the transition team of an incoming administration and officials on that transition team to communicate with their counterparts in foreign governments. That's why there's a transition team to begin with. When announcing the guilty plea by General Flynn for one count of lying to the FBI, the Washington Post, no friend of the Trump administration, made clear how ludicrous it would be to prosecute General Flynn or even to try to prosecute him or even investigate him for violating the Logan Act because he called the Russian ambassador to discuss sanctions. This is what the Washington Post said, quote, the statute has not been used in a prosecution in modern history, and it would not be uncommon for incoming administrations to interface with foreign governments with whom they will soon have to work. So the critical context for understanding the FBI interrogation on January 24th, 2017 of General Flint about the two calls that he had with Ambassador Kislyak is that those interroga that interrogation should never have taken place at all. There was no predicate for having investigated General Flynn criminally. The claim that he was somehow connected to the Russian government's interference in the election had already been rejected by the FBI itself and there was no valid basis for believing or even suspecting that the calls to, Gener to Ambassador Kislyak were even uncommon, let alone criminal, which is why even if General Flynn lied in that interrogation by falsely denying having discussed sanctions with Ambassador Kislyak, and remember the FBI itself, as I demonstrated earlier, concluded immediately after that he didn't lie, that he tried to be cooperative, that if the, at worst he had a faulty memory, but even if he had lied, it wasn't lying about any legitimate investigation and therefore wasn't material to any valid investigation, a crucial, in fact, an indispensable element of the statute that makes it a crime to lie to the FBI. But even beyond the issue of the lack of any credible or legitimate or valid predicate investigations into General Flynn at the time he was investigated, there is a very serious question about whether it should even be a crime at all to lie to the FBI. Now, under the law, as it has been interpreted through precedent from the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals, it is actually a crime to lie to the FBI. It's a crime under Section 1001 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code that makes it a federal crime to knowingly and willfully make a materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement in any matter within the jurisdiction of the executive, legislative, or judicial branch of the United States. Now, that law that does exist has two critical elements. Number one, you have to knowingly lie, meaning it's not enough to just say something false to the FBI because you didn't remember it correctly or you didn't intend to. You have to deliberately mislead the FBI by purposely and knowingly giving them information that you know to be false. And number two, it has to be, the lie has to be material to a legitimate ongoing law enforcement investigation within the proper jurisdiction of the legislative, executive, or judicial branches. Now, the idea that it should be a crime to lie to the FBI is something that a lot of people think is uncontroversial. In fact, about two years ago, when I posted a tweet questioning why lying to the FBI is even a crime at all or should be, it provoked all kinds of indignation from liberals, particularly in Democrats, who said this is proof that I had gone crazy, that I was mad. Of course it has to be a crime to lie to the FBI. This is a very authoritarian mentality and also a very new mentality. It is a very intense debate within law schools, within judicial theorists, and even within courts about whether lying to the FBI should be a crime at all. The reason that it is a debate is because we have a Fifth Amendment that grants you the constitutional right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself if the FBI comes and questions you. 
So why should you have the obligation if the FBI comes and questions you to answer truthfully about whether you committed a crime? If the FBI asks you, did you rob a bank? You have the right to remain silent and not incriminate yourself. Why do you not have the right to falsely deny? No, I didn't rob a bank, which is called an exculpatory no, denying to the FBI that you committed a crime. Under the law as it currently exists, and as some liberals and Democrats and also people on the right long have advocated, even if you didn't commit any crime at all, like if you had a conversation with General Kislyak about sanctions, you can be turned into a criminal if the FBI gets you to lie to them simply by denying that you did that. That is a very extraordinary power to place in the hands of the FBI, and it's not what this statute was originally intended to do. It has evolved and expanded into this mission creep over the years, as so many laws do. The law was enacted during the Civil War as a way of punishing people who were submitting false bills and claims and bilking the federal government by submitting fraudulent charges. So it was made a crime to submit fraudulent or false claims to the FBI. And over the decades, it morphed from that narrow, specific, concrete kind of lie to extract money to which you're not entitled from the federal government into just a general crime that you're never allowed to say anything untruthful to the FBI. And it's always been the authoritarian posture that, that should be a crime. And it's always been the civil libertarian posture or the pro-defendant posture that it shouldn't be. You should have no obligation to give truthful information to the FBI for the same reason that you have no obligation to incriminate yourself. Now, just to underscore the point about how controversial this continues to be, law professors not only debate it constantly, but probably the most compelling opinion written in the modern history of jurisprudence about why this is such a terrible way to understand this law was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg and another opinion by Justice Paul, John Paul Stevens. The idea that it shouldn't be a crime, and in the case of Justice Stevens, isn't a crime and can't be one just to lie to the FBI with nothing else, has been one that's much more common on the liberal and left-wing side of jurisprudence than it has been on the conservative and right-wing side. So let's just look at a couple of examples. First of all, there is a irony to liberals acting indignant over the idea that it may not be fair or justified to consider lying to the FBI to be a crime because one of the clearest cut cases of somebody who lied to the FBI during the Trump administration is Jim Comey's deputy director of the FBI, Andrew McCabe. He got caught lying to the FBI and everyone acknowledges that. He falsely denied having leaked information to journalists that he in fact leaked as part of an FBI investigation into those leaks. He misled the own, his own agency. And yet, not only was there no call by liberals to prosecute Andrew McCabe for lying to the FBI, they did the opposite. They jumped forward and defended him, led by people like MSNBC, on-air personality Rachel Maddow and other liberals, they created a GoFundMe account for Andrew McCabe and raised in 48 hours a half a million dollars for his legal defense, double what he was actually seeking or what was being sought on his behalf. So apparently liberals don't regard lying to the FBI as this grave moral transgression or as a crime when it suits them to believe that. But law professors have made clear in the context of General Flynn's prosecution that it is very debatable and very controversial whether this should be regarded as a crime at all. Amherst Professor of Jurisprudence and Political Science Austin Serrett wrote in 2017, quote, despite the personal moral objections that most people have to lying, the law under which General Flynn was charged by Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller is a controversial one. And as I indicated, the Supreme Court case that makes clear just how controversial this is, is one that was driven by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the 1998 case of Brogan versus the United States. This case was very similar to what the FBI did to General Flynn. In this Brogan case, a union official, Brogan, had accepted money from unions that he was representing, which was a form of corruption and a crime to do. And the FBI knew that he was accepting money, had accepted money from those unions because they had the transactions in their hand. But they wanted to turn him into a further criminal by inducing him to lie to the FBI. 
because it was much harder to prove that he had accepted this money and committed a crime through this union financing than it would have been to get him to lie to the FBI by falsely denying that he accepted money when they had the proof that he had. So they went and interrogated him. They asked him a question to which they already knew the answer, but didn't let him know that they had the evidence. They said, have you been accepting money from these unions that you represent? And he said, no, he falsely denied that he did what he in fact did, the exculpatory no, and then then prosecuted him for that lie. Even though they tricked him, they, they, they lured him into it. They didn't need to ask him. They already knew. By getting him to lie, they turned him into a separate criminal. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg was indignant about the idea that this could be a crime. She concurred in the judgment convicting him, an opinion written by Antonin Scalia, who had no problem with making lying to the FBI, because she said, look, the law does make this a crime, and I can't do anything about that, but I want to write separately to say why this is so unjust, why it's such a miscarriage of justice to let the FBI turn people into criminals simply by getting them to falsely deny that they did something the FBI knows they did, and then suddenly they've committed another felony. And this is what she said in this opinion, quote, because a false denial fits the unqualified language of 18 U.S.C. 1001, I concur in the affirmance of Brogan's conviction. I write separately, however, to call attention to the extraordinary authority Congress, perhaps unwittingly, has conferred on prosecutors to manufacture crimes. I note, at the same time, how far removed the exculpatory no is from the problems Congress initially sought to address when the law was enacted, meaning the law was originally enacted to punish people for extracting money fraudulently from the government by submitting false invoices to the government and somehow has morphed into a generalized power on the part of the FBI to turn you into a felon if they can get you to falsely deny having that you've done something that you in fact did. She then added in her decision, quote, that encompassing formulation arms government agents with authority not simply to apprehend lawbreakers, but to generate felonies, crimes of a kind that only a government officer could provoke. She then noted that the FBI already knew the answer to the questions that they were asking about the money that Brogan was receiving. And this is what she said, quote, even if the encompassing language of Section 101 precludes judicial declaration of an exculpatory no defense, the core concern persists. She cited a 1958 case from the Supreme Court, Sherman versus the United States, which said, the function of law enforcement is the prevention of crime and the apprehension of criminals. Manifestly, that function does not include the manufacturing of crime. The question that the Ruth Bader Ginsburg was interested in was whether they could carve out an exception for people who give an exculpatory no to the FBI, like General Flynn did, who falsely denied that they did something that they don't want the FBI to know that, that they did. Justice Ginsburg said there should be this carve out because it's manifestly unjust to allow the FBI to turn you into a criminal to, by getting you to falsely deny it. She also cited the Justice Department's own manual on how to conduct these interrogations with regard to getting people to lie. And, and that, that manual also warned of the dangers, as she cited, quote, it is the department's policy that it is not appropriate to charge a Section 101, 1001 violation where a suspect during an investigation merely denies his guilt in response to questioning by the government. The DOJ manual, in fact, long barred the Justice Department from pursuing convictions based on nothing more than a person during an interrogation falsely denying having done what they did. And Justice Ginsburg noted that the manual, quote, these pronouncements indicate at the least the dubious propriety of bringing felony prosecutions for bare exculpatory denials informally made to government agents, exactly what General Flynn did. And then finally, Justice Ginsburg, in her concurring opinion, warned Congress that they need to fix this to prevent this authoritarian power to turn people into criminals when they when you get them to falsely deny something in the hands of the FBI that the Congress needs to fix it. She wrote, quote, thus, the prospect remains that an overzealous prosecutor or investigator aware that a person has committed some suspicious acts but unable to make a criminal case will create a crime by surprising the suspect, asking that those acts and receiving a false denial. Congress alone can provide the appropriate instruction. 
Two other liberal justices of the Supreme Court, John Paul Stevens and Stephen Breyer, went further than Justice Ginsburg went. They dissented in the case. They said that the conviction was unjust, that there should never be a case where the FBI can criminally prosecute someone for doing what Judge Flynn, for General Flynn did, which is an exculpatory no, falsely denying to the FBI something the FBI knows that you did and that you don't want the FBI to know about. So it's incredibly controversial to do what the FBI did to General Flynn, to look at lying to the FBI simply in terms of falsely den a false denial as being a crime, let alone a felony. And yet the Democratic Party and American liberalism have become so authoritarianism over the last four years in particular by revering prosecutors, by revering the FBI, by wanting their political adversaries in prison, that they now are embracing as uncontroversial, as indisputable, as not even to be debated, a theory of law that is very new, very controversial, that liberal justices have been railing against, as I just demonstrated, as a serious danger, and which has, has gives the FBI a very potent weapon to turn people into felons who they can't otherwise prove did anything wrong. Now, as I indicated at the start, one of the things I find most disturbing about the defense of the Flynn prosecution is that Democrats and liberals on the left, in order to justify it, in order to justify the broader Mueller probe, have jettisoned and renounced what had been core principles of how the left and liberals view the criminal law and criminal justice. One of the arguments that people make about General Flynn when insisting that he clearly committed a crime was, well, if talking to Ambassador Kislyak isn't really criminal, if he really wasn't doing anything wrong, why did he lie about it? Why did he deny that he did it? Why didn't he just admit to the FBI that he actually talked to General Kislyak, to Ambassador Kislyak, about sanctions? Obviously, the reason he covered it up and lied is because he knows that it was wrong. Think about how pernicious that argument is. It reminds me a lot, to begin with, of the privacy debate that was prompted by the revelations enabled by Edward Snowden in 2013 and 2014 when we revealed that the NSA had created a system of mass surveillance spying on citizens indiscriminately in the internet in the United States and around the world and the argument from authoritarians, from people who defended this mass surveillance scheme was, well, what do you have to hide? If you didn't do anything wrong, you have nothing to hide. That's been the argument of Silicon Valley. Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google at the time, was asked in 2009 whether Google was invading people's privacy, and he responded in a very high-handed and authoritarian manner, well, if there's something that you don't want anyone to know, it's a good indication that you probably shouldn't be doing it in the first place. People lie and cover up things all the time that aren't criminal. Maybe they do it out of embarrassment, Maybe they do it because they believe it ought to be private and secret, certainly something that General Flynn, having spent a career in military intelligence, would be inclined to believe. Or maybe they do it because they know they'll be politically attacked if it gets known. This is a crucial point. The climate at the time that the FBI went and interrogated General Flynn and asked him whether he spoke to Ambassador Kislyak about sanctions was unhinged in terms of depicting any communications with Russians as being sinister and even treasonous. The interrogation took place just two weeks after CNN and BuzzFeed together reported on the briefing by James Comey of the Steele dossier and the claim that the Russians had compromising information to hold over the head of now President Trump. The New York Times and the Washington Post and other media outlets were constantly publishing very detailed articles with headlines like, here are all the contacts Trump officials had with Russians. The climate in the air was very much that simply by speaking to a Russian, let alone talking to them about something sensitive, you were engaged in disloyalty. You were part of the conspiracy that the FBI was investigating, that you might even be guilty of being a traitor or treasonous. It was a McCarthyite climate that said anyone who has contacts with Russians should have their loyalties and patriotism held in suspicion, as happened during the 1950s and 1960s under actual McCarthyism. Remember that Jeff Sessions, 
who became Donald Trump's attorney general, had to recuse himself because while he was a senator, he had two passing informal ordinary conversations with Russians that he had forgotten about. And when it was discovered, those were held up as so incriminating that he couldn't possibly fairly oversee the investigation into whether the Trump campaign conspired with Russia because that was a suggestion that he might have been a conspirator himself. It was in that climate where communications with Russians were being depicted as sinister, as malicious, as grounds for suspicion, as a evidence of disloyalty, as even tre treasonous or traitorous that General Flynn denied to the FBI, potentially, that he had spoken with Ambassador Kislyak about sanctions. There's all the reason in the world he would have to not want people to know that even if it weren't criminal, there'd be political embarrassment from it and he would want to keep it a secret because it was a sensitive conversation. Whatever else is true, whatever else is true, the FBI notes that were just made available made clear that, Pres that General Flynn not only knew his conversations with Ambassador Kislyak were being monitored and recorded by the NSA, obviously he knew that as someone who had worked for decades in this world, but he told the FBI agents, there must be a transcript of my communications with Ambassador Kislyak. I don't know why you need to ask me what I said. You obviously have access to what I said. He'd have no reason to have deliberately misled them. But even if he had deliberately misled them, that's not proof that the underlying act that he was denying having done was a crime. People falsely deny having done things all the time that aren't crimes because it could bring embarrassment or because they think that it might cause political problems. And this argument, well, if you hit something from the FBI that's proof that you're a criminal, is the same argument that says, if you want privacy in your life, if you want secrecy in your life, if you don't want the government to know everything that you're doing, it must mean that you are a terrorist or a pedophile or a criminal. There's just no reason for you to ha want to hide anything from the government unless you've done something underlying that's a crime. General Flynn had all kinds of motives to deny that he spoke with Ambassador Kislyak in that particular climate that was prevailing at the time. But perhaps the worst argument that is being made by Democrats and by liberals and even people on the left, the most pernicious and dangerous, is the argument that says the following. General Flynn pled guilty to a crime. Why would he plead guilty to a crime if he didn't really commit a crime? This is the argument that's being made. And in making that argument, people are throwing away decades of research and activism in protest of the unfairness of the American criminal justice system that has tilted the playing field so far in favor of prosecutors that there's all kinds of reasons why people who haven't committed crimes routinely nonetheless plead guilty to them. This scheme that has been created, for one thing, is such that if you plead guilty to a crime, the prosecutors will promise you leniency. They'll recommend a very short prison term, or in the case of General Flynn, no prison time. But if you choose to go to trial because you don't believe you committed any crime and you're found guilty by a jury, your punishment is going to be immensely increased. There's a built-in in, in, built in incentive to plead guilty to crimes, even if you don't believe that you committed one, even if you're innocent, which is at the risk of going to trial in the way the system is now constructed is way too high and gives prosecutors way too much power. Beyond that, as often happens now, the FBI was threatening General Flynn that they were going to prosecute his son if he refused to plead guilty. Not just prosecute him and seek decades in prison, which is reason enough to plead guilty even if you think you're innocent, but also prosecute his son. And it was as part of the plea agreement that General Flynn succeeded in protecting his son from prosecution by the Mueller team. The same Washington Post article I cited earlier about General Flynn's guilty plea in December 2017 made this clear. It read, quote, as part of Flynn's negotiations, his son, Michael G. Flynn, is not expected to be charged, according to a person with knowledge of the talks. If I were being threatened by the FBI, then unless I pled guilty, my children would be prosecuted and they would try and ruin their lives and throw them in prison and that the difference between pleading guilty or not pleading guilty is no time in jail or 20 years in jail, I would certainly strongly consider pleading guilty even if I had committed no crime. There was a very widely celebrated article in 2014 in the New York Review of Books by a very well-regarded and outspoken federal judge from the Southern District of New York, Jed Rakoff, 
who had long denounced things like minimum mandatory sentences, which forced him to sentence people to prison, nonviolent offenders for unconscionably long periods of time, and had become somewhat of a hero of the criminal justice reform movement. And in this article that he published in 2014, which was widely celebrated by people on the left and by liberals and Democrats and criminal justice reform advocates, he explained the whole point of the article and the reason it became so widely celebrated was to explain why so often in our criminal justice system, prosecutors are able to successfully induce people to plead guilty to crimes even though they're innocent. The headline of that article was why innocent people plead guilty, something that a lot of liberals and Democrats are now willing to just throw away in order to defend the prosecution of Michael Flynn on the grounds, well, he pled guilty. That obviously means he's guilty. Why would any innocent person plead guilty to a crime? It happens all the time. And the reason is, the reasons I've said, and the reason that Judge Rakoff so eloquently and compellingly laid out in this article that became one of the most influential articles about the criminal justice reform movement, it's really worth listening to much of what he wrote to understand why this argument is so odious that's being made to say if just if General Flynn pled guilty, it's proof that he's a criminal. Judge Rakoff wrote, quote, in 2013, while 8% of all federal criminal charges were dismissed, either because of a mistake in fact or law or because the defendant had decided to cooperate, more than 97% of the remainder were resolved through plea bargains and fewer than 3% went to trial. That's because there's almost no situation in which a criminal defendant is incentivized to risk going to trial. They would always be incentivized to plead guilty, even if they committed no crime, because the punishments for going to trial and rolling the dice are so much greater, whereas prosecutors have so much discretion to say to you, if you plead guilty, we'll recommend a month in prison or a year in prison instead of 20 years or in Judge Flynn's case, no prison time and will protect your son. That's why 97% of cases that aren't dismissed and not in a trial by a jury of your peers, but by plea bargaining, people saying they're guilty because there's just everything in the system is designed to prevent people from going to trial. And then he goes on to explain why that means that so many innocent people plead guilty. He wrote, quote, one thing that did become quickly apparent, however, was that these guidelines, along with mandatory minimums, are causing the virtual extinction of jury trials in federal criminal cases. Thus, whereas in 1980, 19% of all federal defendants went to trial, by 2000, the number had decreased to less than 6%, and by 2010 to less than 3%, where it has remained ever since. The reason for this is that the guidelines, like mandatory minimums, provide prosecutors with weapons to bludgeon defendants and to effectively coerce plea bargain. He's telling you that prosecutors can bludgeon people and do frequently bludgeon people who are innocent into pleading guilty, which is why we should never accept this argument. Well, he pled guilty. Why would he have done that if he weren't a criminal? Judd Radkoff concluded with the following extremely compelling and important point, quote, but what really puts the prosecutor in the driver's seat is the fact that he, because of mandatory minimums, sentencing guidelines, and simply his ability to shape whatever charges are brought, can effectively dictate the sentence by how he publicly describes the offense. For example, the prosecutor can agree with the defense counsel in a federal narcotics case that if there is a plea bargain, the defendant will only have to plead guilty to the personal sale of a few ounces of heroin, which carries no mandatory minimum and a guidelines range of less than two years. But if the defendant does not plead guilty, he will be charged with the drug conspiracy, of which his sale was a small part, a conspiracy involving many kilograms of heroin, which would mean a 10-year minimum, mandatory minimum and a guidelines range of 20 years or more. Put another way, it is the prosecutor, not the judge, who effectively exercises the sentencing power, albeit cloaked as a charging decision. The defense lawyer understands this fully, and so she recognizes that the best outcome for her client is likely to be an early plea bargain, while the prosecutor is still willing to accept a plea to a relatively low-level offense. He then concluded, Third, and possibly the gravest objection of all, the prosecutor dictated plea bargaining system by creating such inordinate pressure to enter into plea bargains appears to have led a significant number of defendants to plead guilty to crimes that they never actually committed. For example, of the approximately 300 people that the Innocence Project and its affiliated lawyers have proven were wrongfully convicted of crimes of rape or murder that they did not in fact commit, at least 30 or about 10% 
pleaded guilty to those crimes. Presumably they did so because even though they were innocent, they faced the likelihood of being convicted of capital offenses. But other publicized cases arising with disturbing frequency suggest that this self-protective psychology operates in non-capital cases as well. And recent studies suggest that this is a widespread problem. For example, the National Registry of Exonerations, a joint project of Michigan Law School and Northwestern, records that of 1,428 legally acknowledged exonerations that have occurred since 1989 involving the full reign of felony, felony, felony charges, 151, or again, about 10%, involved false guilty pleas. We need to stop using authoritarian arguments to justify the prosecution of General Flynn and the Mueller probe generally. There is no reason to say that in all cases where a person lies to the FBI, they, are become, a, they become a felon. There is no reason to take the position that people have no reason to lie to the FBI or to hide things from the FBI that they did unless what they're hiding is a crime. And there's certainly no reason to adopt the position that nobody would ever plead guilty if they were really innocent when all of this social science and analytical research demonstrates that it is now common for innocent people to plead guilty because the playing field is so tilted against them. The FBI and the Justice Department to say nothing of the CIA and the NSA, have extraordinary, immense, and often uncontrolled powers. And they use this power just as Chuck Schumer warned Donald Trump they would when talking to Rachel Maddow to subvert and undermine and ostracize and attack and destroy the reputation of countless officials of a campaign and a transition team and an administration that for political and ideological and personal reasons they strongly disliked, and the prosecution of General Flynn is one of the most egregious, not the most egregious, but one of the most egregious examples illustrating that abuse of power, that systemic abuse of power by these security state agencies. Now, one concluding point that is vital here to acknowledge is that none of the abuses applied to General Flynn or to other people as part of the Mueller probe, including Carter Page, are particularly rare or uncommon. Quite the contrary, there are all kinds of examples throughout modern history of the FBI, of the CIA, of the NSA, of the DOJ abusing their powers in all sorts of ways. There are all kinds of abuses of power of the security states for political ends or for other improper motives. Beyond that, there are, in the United States, more prisoners in federal and state prisons than in any other country in the world. The U.S. prison population is the largest in the world. So if you're a conservative outraged by the inequities and the abuses that the, that the justice system entails, you should be angry about that, not only as it applies to General Flynn, but to the hundreds of thousands of prisoners whose plea bargains are coerced or who have all kinds of abusive investigative techniques used against them, who are monitored improperly, who are surveilled improperly. These abuses are endemic to the justice system, and they ought to be denounced in all cases, not just when they're used against a powerful general and political official like Michael Flynn or someone who's well-connected like Carter Page. Nonetheless, it is the case that when the CIA and the FBI and the DOJ and the NSA abuse their power in the middle of a presidential campaign or for overtly political reasons to undermine a newly elected president who they're ideologically opposed to or who they otherwise dislike, it does provide unique harms to our democracy and to the political system and to the justice system and the rule of law that we ought to be particularly denouncing, and that is clearly the case here. Now, just one note about this episode, this show. System Update is typically, not always, but typically an interview program as well as a program that entails my own commentary and analysis. And for that reason, we tried very hard to have on the show any of the number of cable news personalities or ex-security state agents who have spent the last three years propounding all kinds of Russiagate conspiracy theories against numerous individuals in the Trump administration, as well as specifically against General Flynn. Perhaps unsurprisingly, not a single person that we asked to have a discussion about these issues was willing to do so. Many ignored the request outright or simply rejected it. And the reason is clear because they're able to go on CNN and MSNBC and spout these baseless theories 
in a completely unchallenged way. There are a couple of hosts on those networks that ask probing questions sometimes, but by and large, it's a propaganda outlet where they're able to say anything, even as deceitful and as obviously warped as can be without any challenge. So they don't want to have any kind of a adversarial or even a critically minded discussion. They want to be free to just disseminate claims without being challenged. One of the few times that a Russiagate theorist was actually questioned was the Guardian columnist Luke Harding, who wrote a book purporting to prove that there was active collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government a collusion or a conspiracy that the Mueller investigation was unable to find or to establish. And when Luke Harding agreed, perhaps unwittingly, to be interviewed by one of the Russiagate skeptics, one of the most informed ones and persistent ones, Aaron Mate, who often writes about Russiagate in the nation, he was completely stumped to the point where he finally just terminated the interview abruptly because he was so unaccustomed to actually being questioned because the media consensus, the pieties and the orthodoxies, with very few exceptions, has been overwhelmingly that you can say whatever you want about Russiagate. You can call people Kremlin agents. You can claim they're acting on behalf of the Russian government. You can claim that Vladimir Putin has infiltrated the U.S. government. You can accuse people of criminality if you don't like them politically, and you'll never be challenged or questioned. So it's completely unsurprising, but nonetheless very revealing that not a single one of these new, newly minted cable news stars who used to work in the Pentagon or the DOJ or the FBI or the CIA or the NSA was willing to have what would have been a completely civil discussion, but nonetheless ones where their claims are questioned and subjected to critical scrutiny. One particular person who we asked is Evelyn Farkas, who is a former Obama administration defense official, who is currently running for Congress. So you would think she would look forward to any platforms where she could be heard. She spent years claiming, insisting that she had inside knowledge, proving that there was collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, urging that anyone who has that information in their possession inside the government come forward with it, warning that the Trump administration would actually seek to destroy it and never let it see the light of day. She became a major cable star by making all these claims. And yet when the newly released House Intelligence Committee transcripts were released within the past couple of weeks, including her testimony, she acknowledged under oath in secret something wildly different than what she had been saying on cable for years without challenge, which is that she actually had no knowledge of collusion, no knowledge of the things she was opining about on cable news so authoritatively by claiming that she actually did have knowledge. She was one of the people who we asked to join us to have a discussion. Her campaign manager originally indicated the interest and then got back and said, Evelyn will not be participating. They don't want to be questioned because they don't need to be because the media platforms that they use enable them, empower them to spread falsehoods and propaganda without ever being challenged. The final point I think is really worth emphasizing that for me uh, underlies all of these issues is that it has long been a widely accepted the belief in the U.S. political system on both the left and the right that it is extremely dangerous to have the CIA and the NSA and the DOJ and Homeland Security and the FBI, given the incredibly invasive powers that they wield, abuse those powers for political ends. And this is an instance where they clearly abuse those powers in the middle of a presidential campaign to influence that campaign, and then ultimately to try and subvert and undermine a new administration that they disliked. Now, it may be very well true, it in, in fact is true, that there were elements of the FBI that interfered in the 2016 election with a different goal, with the opposite goal of helping Hillary Clinton or undermining Hillary Clinton and helping Donald Trump. There were definitely leaks from the FBI and other intelligence agencies during the campaign that were designed to have the opposite effect of helping Trump and hurting Hillary Clinton. But that doesn't make this interference, this abuse of power against Trump officials, campaign officials, and then transition officials, and then administration officials, any more noble. It's also possible if you want to believe that there was wrongdoing as, as part of the relationship between Trump and Russia that the Mueller investigation simply couldn't establish because they couldn't find evidence to prove it in a court of law. But that, too, doesn't obviate the fact that there was extremely serious corruption 
on the part of the investigators looking into those conspiracy theories. I believe that the corruption and the abuse of power is far more severe on the part of the FBI investigators and the DOJ investigators and the people inside the Obama administration and then afterwards who are holdovers who abuse their law enforcement powers and their investigative powers and their surveillance powers for political and corrupt ends. But you don't have to weigh those or rank them to be disturbed by the unjust prosecution of Michael Flynn and the other injustices that took place as part of the Mueller investigation, including things like lying to the FISA court to get warrants on Carter Page to eavesdrop on his communication, which took place prior to the start of the Mueller investigation, but then all kinds of efforts by Mueller, including the prosecution of Michael Flynn, despite FBI agents concluding that he didn't actually lie to them, and despite all the other reasons that make this prosecution unjust. Whatever else is true, the, the alleged wrongdoing as part of the Trump-Russia relationship has received inordinate media attention, endless amounts of media attention in an 18 month subpoena driven investigation by a tenacious prosecutor and a team of prosecutors who had all the resources in the world that became the Mueller investigation. By contrast, the wrongdoing on the part of the FBI led by James Comey and the DOJ and the CIA and the NSA, all of which has been documented in the last uh, hour of this program, has barely received any media attention at all. In fact, the newly released documents that I've been discussing have barely been mentioned, if they've been mentioned at all, by the same networks that have been trying to convince people that the Trump-Russia conspiracy theory is true. They just blackball or suppress any information that contradicts the propagandistic theories they've been peddling, which shows that they're not actually doing journalism, they're doing propaganda. And that's the reason that it was necessary and important to devote an entire program of system update to evaluating the facts underlying this case because there are so few other media outlets doing it for reasons that are very ignoble and very malevolent. I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope it was eye-opening and thought-provoking. As always, if you like the program, you can subscribe to The Intercept's YouTube show so that you're automatically notified of new content, not just from System Update, but from our other journalists as well. Thanks very much.